Opinions expressed by the host of Autism Live and her guests are meant solely as suggestion and should not be in any way construed as child-specific advice. The Center for Autism and Related Disorders advises working with a board-certified behavior analyst who has experience with autism before starting any intensive behavioral intervention. Any choices you make in determining your child's treatment are completely at your own discretion. and welcome to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod and we are webcasting to you live from the Center for Autism and Related Disorders headquarters in Tarzana, California. So uh, thrilled to be here with you this morning and to be furthering a discussion in a lot of different directions. We are going to be live for the next two hours talking about autism and how you and I can be more effective, more efficient, working with a child on the autism spectrum, helping them to reach their fullest potential. That's what this show is about. It's meant to be interactive. We hope that you will participate and there are lots of different ways for you to participate. I'm going to ask Emily to cycle through some of the different ways that you can get a hold of us here and I'm going to remind you that the only way you can watch us live at this moment in time, although there are other ways coming in the future, uh, you can watch us live on autism-live.com. When you go there you will see uh, our lovely new site, my desktop there, and you'll see there's a box that says Shannon is answering right now. That box is active during the live show. Uh, you can type whatever you'd like into that box, whatever question you have, whatever comment you have, and it shows up magically right here on my actual desktop. And that gives me the ability to forward that question to an expert, to ask somebody who's in the studio, and we are going to have... I'm very excited. at the. Uh, you know, there is something kismet about this show, our, our little show that could, that we talk about here, um, that... It, something happens sometimes and and it just works out exactly right and uh, of course we're all very aware of what happened on Friday the horrible tragic shooting in Newtown and we're all devastated uh, and there are no words and of course we we found out during Friday's show and we said then and it continues to be true that our thoughts and prayers are with all of the victims families and there are no words, right? There are no words. But there are things that we have to talk about, especially in light of some of the information that has come to light over the weekend. A lot of misinformation has come out, and there are things that our community needs to talk about. And as I was thinking about, okay, in my ideal world, who could we have on the show today to shed some light on some different things we already had booked people for to come and talk about other things who are the exact people that we need to talk to so uh I, and we'll talk more about that in a few minutes but i i just want to say how important it is in these difficult times for us to all stick together um, to be kind to one another and to remain hopeful. I know that that's hard, but that's one of the things that we're going to be talking about today, how, how we remain hopeful and how we take action to do things that are positive. And that's really what this entire week is going to be about. In addition to helping our individual children, uh, which is always on the top of our list, right? Um, so a really exciting show for you and uh, many things to talk about that hopefully, I know I need some answers. That there were people who were calling me over the weekend and saying, you know, before anything else was said about autism, as we were looking at the information that was coming in and how devastating it was, I think we all were looking for answers. Um, and, I, and I think really at the crux of it, that's part of the issue is that people grasp for what can I hang on to when it's 
seems as though the ground is shifting below me, um, that people want a definitive answer, and unfortunately, the world just isn't that black and white. And in this shifting sands of let's, let's be able to name what this is so that we can say, okay, this is why this happened, um, there is a lot of discussion about was the shooter someone who was on the autism spectrum, and did that have something to do with what happened? And I know it has raised a lot of questions in a lot of people's minds, and people were calling me saying, you know, what's your take on this? Um, and it is my understanding, as we had talked about this before, that when you look at the diagnosis for autism, which we're going to talk about again in just a second, um, there is nothing about sociopathic behaviors. And that is clearly what we saw on Friday. I am not an expert in psychology, which is why we're going to have an expert with us in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, I, I know I've practically memorized that diagnosis and there is nothing on there about sociopathic behavior and clearly that's what we saw on Friday. But we are going to shed some light on this and uh, answer your questions and uh, not only do we have uh, one of the preeminent psychologists dealing in the field of autism that's going to be with us this morning, but a little bit later we have arguably the most famous young man um, with Asperger's who's going to be with us here this morning. Uh, planned to talk about something else that we will talk about, but uh, we are also going to talk to him about his take on what happened on Friday. But again, um, that doesn't change the fact that our thoughts and prayers continue to be with those families uh, who th the loss is immeasurable absolutely immeasurable. And as I said, there are no words. Still, we forge on because that is what life is all about, right? And as autism parents and teachers and practitioners, we know you forge on. So we like to start every morning with something we fondly refer to as the jargon of the day. And uh, today's we always take one word, one phrase, one anagram and try to demystify it so that we understand what it is that we're talking about when experts talk about our children and when we're talking about our children. And our, uh, our word phrase anagram for today is the DSM. Uh, you hear people talking about the DSM-4 and the DSM-5 that's coming up. So what exactly is it that we're talking about? Uh, the actual definition, it's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental disorders. Uh, it's published by the American Psych Psychiatric Association. And the long and the short of it is, is that this is the current resource for criteria for an autism diagnosis. Uh, they are these lovely tomes, uh, and the current one is the DSM-4. And when they adopt a new version, because changes, they make changes, they update things and try to perfect things, make it more efficient, more effective, right? So the DSM-4 Five has been worked on now for many years. Um, it has not been fully adopted and it is expected to be adopted in 2013 and it will change the diagnosis as it is written right now, uh, the DSM-5, it will change the diagnosis of autism and there's a lot of hubbub about that. Currently uh, in the DSM-4 there is a specific criteria for autism and if you don't meet that you might meet the criteria for PDD-NOS, pervasive developmental disorder not otherwise specified, or you might meet the criteria for Asperger's syndrome, which is different than autism under the current DSM-4. Under the DSM-5, one of the proposed changes is that they will do away with PDD-NOS and do away with Asperger's and make it all autism spectrum disorder, and that they will have a criteria uh, on the different elements about whether you are greatly affected or only mildly affected. Uh, this certainly is something that has caused anxiety and concern out of uh, members of our community about how that's all going to shake down and what it will mean for services. But I think it's important for us uh, always to understand what the diagnostic criteria is, how we apply it to our children. Um, it is not 
cut and dried, unfortunately, which raises a great deal of discussion, both in our community and outside our community, about whether someone truly is on the spectrum, whether they have PDD-NOS, whether they're classic autism, whether they're Asperger's. But if you read the, diag the, the diagnostic criteria, it begins to get clearer. Um, you can certainly see where on a given day a child might exhibit behavior that they don't exhibit on another day. Um, so again, it's not the criteria is not so very black and white, um, but important for us to always understand that criteria because that is currently how we diagnose. And I'm always reminding you guys that nowhere in the criteria of any of those three things does it say tantrums, does it say violent behavior towards themselves or to other people. Um, nowhere in that criteria does it talk about uh, sociopathic behavior towards society. Um, it it talks about a delay in language, talks about a delay in social skills, and it also talks about repetitive and ritualistic behaviors. And those that, those are the classic, uh, the three areas, and there are sub things underneath each one of those. And we know that uh, in any of the areas, PDD, NOS, autism, or Asperger's that there is an element of social delay. But as we saw, I'm sure that like me, you saw a lot of different people writing in on Facebook and some of them adults with Asperger's or a classic autism uh, diagnosis saying, yes, I have difficulty with social situations, but that doesn't mean that I want to hurt other people. And I think it's really important for all of us to be loud and clear with the facts. Um, and again, you know, I'm not an expert. Uh, I am a mother with a child on the autism spectrum, and uh, that gives me great concern for him walking through the world. And um, I, I know that part of this journey for me has been not only do I need to educate myself, and, and not only do I have a desire to give information and make information available to those in the community, but we all have a responsibility to educate the world. It's not what we wanted, right? I, that's a burden that I did not expect when my child was diagnosed with autism. It doesn't matter. It's there. We have to educate the world and let them know. Um, and again, we will be talking about more of that throughout the rest of today's show and this week. We always have a question for you. Every day, we like to ask you guys a question that we hope you'll answer on Facebook so that everybody can see your answers. And you guys are already uh, responding in, in great numbers. But today, we want to know what gives you hope. Today is a day when, uh, you know, we need it every day, but have we ever needed it more than we need today? Uh, so what gives you hope? And when you name it, uh, you give the possibility that somebody else can find it. And hope is something that doesn't come in a jar, doesn't come from a credit card swipe, right? Uh, so spread a little hope today. What gives you hope? Um, I will tell you that for me, um, I believe that uh, there is good. Uh, and there are people, and I have seen evidence in my life, there are people who really want to help and that certainly have helped us on our journey. And that's the thing that gives me hope. Is, and if we can spread that, <laughs> you know, the world is a better place. And uh, I know that the world is a better place because my child is in it. And I hope that you know that too. Um, all right, we also always have a topic of the day, uh, which is our topic for the week. And, and can I tell you that this was decided months ago? This was decided back like uh, in September that for this week, our topic would be hope and how much do we need it? Uh, and so there we have it. Some of the different things that I've already mentioned that we're going to be talking about today. Uh, in just a few minutes, we're going to talk about stress. Like so many of you out there today, I had to kiss my child goodbye and know that he is going to walk onto his school campus and that we are not there with him. And I think like a lot of you, that was a stressful moment. So we're going to talk about what we can do to help our children through this stressful time and to help ourselves um, in a very 
very practical terms uh, to lower the stress and have it not prevent us from the things that we really want to do with our lives. Uh, we have special guests that are going to be joining us at the top of the next hour. I mentioned that arguably one of the most famous individuals with Asperger's is going to be here. That's Alex Plank. Alex is the creator of an amazing website, wrongplanet.net. You can visit there. And if you have young teenagers uh, to adults that are on the spectrum, if you're watching and you are uh, between the ages of 13 and whatever on the spectrum, I really want to encourage you to go to wrongplanet.net. This is an amazing site. Alex is, uh, he is on the spectrum and he is a filmmaker. Went to film school, is a brilliant filmmaker, by the way. And he created this site because he uh, you know, and I'll let him talk about that, but he felt that it was needed, and it certainly was. And they showcase a lot of different things on the site, and people get to talk about the kinds of issues that they're interested in. I think it's an amazing site. And even more to the point, Alex has made some incredible films that I think are really helpful to our kids. Things like top, one of my favorite clips that he has uh, that I think we're going to show later on in the week is How to, how to Flirt. Uh, and it's just really great filmmaking. Well, Alex is going to be with us today. Uh, it was scheduled for him to come in with uh, one of his colleagues, Noah Trevino. Trevino, excuse me, is going to be here to talk about a documentary that they have made about autism in France. And the name of the film is Shameful. So I guess that tells you a little bit about what it's about. But we're going to be talking with them about the plight of families and children in particular uh, with autism in the in France and and what it's like there and how you might be interested in seeing this film so that's at 11 o'clock today and, and I spoke to Alex this morning and I said Alex it's just you know I, I really want to talk to you about this and your take on what happened on Friday and your opinion and he said absolutely so we will talk about that and if you have questions feel free to write those in at any point uh, we also are going to be deb debuting just in a few minutes uh, uh, our new cooking segment called What's Left. Um, and this is GFCFSF cooking with Lisa Ackerman from Taka, the founder of Taka. And the reason why it's called What's Left, for those of us who have children on the autism spectrum who or, you know, have other issues with, uh, in life, but also have food issues where there are things that they're reactive to or allergic to or have the potential to become allergic to, um, you know, we start pulling things out of their diet. And I know, uh, when I talk to people about the kinds of things that my son doesn't eat, the question that they always say is, What's left? What can you possibly be feeding that child? Well, Lisa Ackerman is a great advocate and a great uh, autism mom and a great cook. So uh, she had said to us, she visited us a couple of months ago and said, hey, I'd love to do a cooking segment because I make some pretty awesome food. And I sat here and when she said that, I said, oh, you know, that's lovely and let's do it. But it's probably not stuff that my kid can have because there's my child's on more restrictive diet than anybody else I know. And she said, yeah, no, 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 I've got, I've got some recipes for you. And and oddly enough, uh, my child can have most of them. So there you go. Uh, in any case, we're going to debut the first of those cooking segments in just about 10 minutes here. And then right after that, we are going to be joined by Dr. Travis Thompson, who, as I mentioned, is one of the preeminent uh, psychologists in the field of autism, uh, a brilliant gentleman that I had the pleasure of meeting and talking to back at the ABAI conference earlier this year. He's written many books on the subject of autism. And uh, one of the nicest, kindest, sweetest gentlemen, uh, so knowledgeable about autism, so thrilled. He's going to be talking to us about a conference that's coming up in January that we all need to be thinking about going to. It's an autism conference that has a specific track for parents. He's going to be talking with us about that. But of course, I'm going to ask him some questions about Friday's events uh, and hope to clarify clarify a little bit from his point of view what um, what we should all know 
uh, what we should be aware of and what the world should know. So all of that and more. And of course, we would like your input. So we're going to take a short break and come back and talk about stress, how we deal with getting our kids to school these next couple of days and how we deal with their stress about attending school. How do we talk to them about this? How do we talk to ourselves about this to lower the stress? Stick with us. We'll be right back. Every child with autism deserves a bright future. Without further clarification, the Affordable Care Act could actually result in less benefits for individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We urge Catherine Sebelius to clarify the Affordable Health Care Act. She can make one change, one little minor change, to make applied behavioral analysis be part of the health care plan. By signing this petition, you are protecting the health care benefits of individuals with autism spectrum disorders. We need to make sure that we are heard and seen. Sign a petition at autism-live.com. Here's how you can show your infinite support. Create your own infinity ribbon. What you're gonna do is take a ribbon that's been cut about eight inches long, and you're gonna grab one end and then twist it, and then take the two ends and join them together, and then take this together, and then I'm gonna flip it around, and take another piece of tape, and what I have is double-sided sticky tape, squeeze down, you have your very own infinity ribbon. With ABA. The possibilities are infinite. With ABA. The possibilities are infinite. With ABA, 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 the possibilities are infinite. Kicking off our week of hope. There we are. With ABA, the possibilities are infinite. There's some hope for you. Uh, and I got to see that firsthand in my, in my living room. Um, but I want to take a second here to talk about stress because we know that stress is a real part of this journey through autism. And especially in light of the events that happened on Friday, I know uh, you could almost feel the level of stress ratchet up for anyone who has a school age child unbelievable nightmare of nightmares and uh, as we watched images of these families and I know that we all how could you help yourself from putting yourself in the circumstances and thinking what if that were my kid and I do believe that we're built in with these protective things to protect our children so the next thing was you know can I ever really send my child back to school that's certainly what I was talking about on Friday uh, afternoon thinking oh man how am I going to take him back to school on Monday and one of the things that we know is that um, we have to be able to keep fear um, in, in logical places, right? Uh, I've mentioned before on the show that I am somebody who, after my child was diagnosed with I had never had a panic attack in my life until my child had been diagnosed with autism. And I think it was about a year in, as the financial stuff started going, um, that I had my first panic attack. Woohoo, right? Not something to get excited about. Um, and I wasn't sure what it was at first, but I had a friend who had had panic attacks and I said, okay, this thing just happened to me and I don't know what it is, uh, you know? And he said, yeah, no, that's what, that's a panic attack right there. Um, not pleasant at all. And, uh, if you're somebody who has had panic attacks, not only is the panic attack bad, but then afterwards the fear that you're going to have another one is really, I think probably worse because that's the thing that you live with for a very long time. I was really lucky that I got help. Uh, part of it was that I asked for help. Um, and I do think that it's really important for us today to remember that if you need help, you have to ask. And it's whether you need help for yourself or you need help with your child, right? If we could all get it, I don't want to judge. We don't have all the information, but I'm going to guess from the information that we've heard that that 
there was a family uh, at the core of this whole thing that needed some help. And, uh, and I don't know that they didn't ask for it, because a lot of times people ask for it and they don't get hooked up with it right away, and that needs to change. But the first step that's within our control is to ask for help when we need it. Um, and I did ask for help, and I got help through cognitive behavior therapy, which is, uh, in some respects, it's a relation to ABA, um, that I found it really beneficial for myself, and I apply the principles of cognitive behavior therapy to my child on a regular basis and his coping with his anxiety and his stress. And one of the first things that I learned is that when we are having anxiety, when we are having fear, that it's really important, if possible, to name it. You know how sometimes you just have that free-floating anxiety and you go, I don't know what's going on right now, but I feel really anxious and I feel uncomfortable. Um, and this is what happened this morning with my son. It was time to get him dressed to go to school. And I had a conversation with him and he was a little out of sorts. And we've had a rough week, right? Um, that we talked about the shooting in Newtown on Friday night. Um, and, you know, this is a week in which my son lost his grandmother and he's been on planes and his sleep schedule has been discombobulated, right? He's had a lot to go through in the last week. And then we had to talk about the shooting. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot said about it over the weekend. And we avoided watching a lot of excessive TV and images that would have to do with it. Um, but we did have to talk about it this morning because, the, uh, the you know, uh, he was going off to school and I know that his school is having a drill this morning that was already scheduled. So we did talk about that and he said to me, I don't want to go to school. And I said to him, okay, what's going on? And he said, and this is the brilliance of ABA that he now is able to use these terms. He said, I feel uncomfortable. And it was one of those moments because I thought, ah, that's the truth. That is the absolute truth. Uh, he feels uncomfortable. I feel uncomfortable. And I was able to just say to him, yes, I feel uncomfortable too. Let's talk about it. Where do you feel this uncomfortable? He said all over. And then I said, you know, can we talk about, is this because of grandma? Uh, and he said, I don't think so. And I said, is this because you're having this drill in school today? I don't know. Is it because of what happened in that school on Friday? And are you afraid that that's what's gonna happen in your school? I don't know, I feel uncomfortable. And I said, you know, it's okay to feel uncomfortable. Um, it, you, you know, nothing bad is going to happen because you feel uncomfortable. Um, and we can do this, kind of talk ourselves through this as well. And I said, you know, can we name what the fear is? And he still couldn't. And sometimes we can't. Um, but if we can name it, then we can start to deal with it, right? And talk about is this a reasonable fear? Has this ever happened before? Well, clearly we see that something happened on Friday in Connecticut. Has it ever happened in our school? No. Uh, what are the odds, right? Every time you get on a plane, you're aware of the fact that sometimes planes uh, fall from the sky. It's very unusual. It doesn't happen every day, but sometimes it does happen. But if you put it in perspective and say, how many times have I flown before? Have I had this feeling before? Did it end up being okay? Yes. So you're putting it into a larger context for yourself. And we can do this for our kids as well. As I'm saying goodbye to my child this morning and thinking about Friday, I had to remind myself he's gone to school and he's been very safe. Um, do I have any kind of guarantee that he will be okay or that any of our kids will be okay? I don't. But the reality is, is that more children die uh, from being in a car as horrible as that is to think about than from being at a school. I have a right to my fear. I'm not trying to say, let it go, but just trying to put it into a perspective where we can deal with it. And ultimately, I gave my child a choice. I said, you know what? You don't have to go to school today. If you'd like to stay home, you can. But just realize that if you don't go to school today, you'll miss the practice that they're going to, the drill that they're going to have. You'll miss the play practice that they're going to have. You will miss the special lunch that they're going to have. And you know the rules that if you stay home, there's no video games for the rest of the day. So it's up to you. Would you like to stay home uh, and deal with those consequences and say those words? But I said, would you like to stay home and have those rules? Or do you think you want to go to school and know that you're feeling uncomfortable? And he chose to go to school.
Um, I kind of did the same thing for myself that I thought to myself, well, you know, I could keep him home from school today, but there are consequences to that. He won't learn the things. He won't have the social opportunities. Is that what I want for my child? Um, one of the things that I realized when I was having my panic attacks was that they stemmed from the very real fear that I couldn't protect my child from the world. That ultimately what I said to the therapist was, I'd like to duct tape him to the wall and know that he's going to be safe forever. And what she said to me was, nobody gets that guarantee. It just doesn't exist. It's terrible and it's hard, but that's what being a grown up is about is realizing that every moment that we have is a gift. Uh, and you know that old saying, uh, ships in the harbor are safe, but ships were never meant to stay in the harbor. And the reality is it would be all too easy to say that this shooting that happened on Friday was because there wasn't enough safety measures. The truth is that the safety measures were there and the shooter was determined. And there's very little that can be done about that. But as we think about things and we think, okay, I'm having this anxiety, I'm putting it into context, the question we always want to ask ourselves, is there something that I can do about it? Is there, some, is there something, now if you need to go to your child's school today and look at their safety measures and say, you know, it's important to me that you beef this up, do it take some action, make sure that you've done what you can, and then trust and have hope. We have our Charlie Brown Christmas tree today because it's about hope this week. And we have to be hopeful, if for no other reason, for our kids. Tragedies happen. I don't know why, but they do. Um, but they don't happen every day. We can take action, we can remind ourselves that we've done what we need to do and prepare our kids, and then we have to turn it over and we have to have hope. We, uh, we, we have hopeful things to talk about today and we're gonna continue to talk about them and it's time for our, uh, to debut for the first time on this show, our What's Left cooking segment with the fabulous Lisa Ackerman, who is the founder of TACA. Talk about curing autism, an amazing woman, an amazing organization. If you have a child on the spectrum, I want to encourage you to go to their website, www.tacanow, so tacanow.org. Uh, they have so much information, and one of the things that they provide lots of information about is if your child needs to be on a restricted diet because it's what's right for them. And for a lot of our kids on the spectrum who have issues with uh, immune issues, with uh, stomach pain, with constant headaches, even sometimes seizures, will uh, respond well to specific diets. Uh, my child is gluten-free, casein-free, and was soy-free for many years, is no longer soy-free. And Lisa has put together a few segments for us, cooking segments. The recipes, by the way, for today's featured dishes are featured on our uh, Facebook site so that you can go there and find the recipes and make these amazing things. I wasn't there when they did the cooking segment, but I, everybody's still talking about how good the food was. And these are people who are not on restricted diets. So you know it's good <laughs> when they like to eat it. So take a look. This is going to be Lisa Ackerman uh, giving us what's left and right Right after that, we're going to be joined by Dr. Travis Thompson, really one of the brilliant minds in the field of psychology and autism. So you're going to want to stay tuned for that. But take a look. This is What's Left. You say hi, we say hi. Let's get wild, let's get wild. Let's get, let's get, 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 let's get wild. Hi there, I'm Lisa Ackerman. Welcome to the show. We're gonna have some fun today. We're gonna to be making some food that children may actually eat. We're very allergy friendly here. So the goal of today, we're gonna to make meat puffs. So let's get started. We're puffing out here, looking for puff daddy at some point in time, but I don't think he's coming. Let me take you through the meat puff story. It's a long story. But basically my son, like a lot of kids with autism, uh, didn't eat any meat, didn't like any protein found he had a zinc deficiency, so address that, but still had to address all the sensory issues he was experiencing. So how I did that was modifying a meat recipe that a lot of people have done 
and make it a kid-friendly recipe so it's a small hands, small food, ready to go. Today we're using organic turkey to make our meat puff. We started with a pound of the turkey, boiled the meat for about 10 minutes. I'm going to stick it in the food processor and get that ready to go. And it's super easy to do and I use a little bit of the liquid, probably uh, less than a quarter cup of the liquid to get it going. Stick it into your handy dandy food processor. So really what you're trying to shoot for is what a very fine consistency. So for me, this is what I'm shooting for. It's a, a consistency that really is for sensory kids. It's what you would feed someone that had no teeth. One of the things I use, this Italian squash or yellow squash in some stores. So did the same thing in the food processor. And again, your goal is as fine a texture as you want. Longer in the food processor, more of a fine texture. Shorter time in the food processor, bigger chunks. So think of it as Gerber graduates. You can start with the finest texture first for your kids and then graduate. Dun, dun, dun. We are adding into this recipe an egg our baking soda, our, um, our potato flakes, which are fabulous. And again, um, that was about a cup of our potato flakes. And I'm adding um, organic flaxseed. Um, organic ground flaxseed really helps our kids, especially the ones with poop trouble. And I think if we talk about autism, we've got to like caveat and talk about poop trouble at all times. And this is our time to try to fix it. A lot of kids don't like very spicy things. So adults, you may want to add your salt and pepper very um, lightly on the kid batches. And then as you get to the table, maybe for the adults, you can then add more salt and pepper. They don't need as much seasoning. We want to mix it all together. I'm a big fan of parchment paper. Almost all the products we're cooking with are an aluminum base. Stainless steel is preferred. I even like a ceramic as much as possible. With parchment paper, and you don't really have to worry about anything about the aluminum. It still will leach through a little bit, but definitely not as much. What I love about meat puffs more than anything is that these are so easy to freeze. Since so many of our kids have allergies, I try to use um, things that are easier for them to digest. In this case, in this recipe, I use potato flakes. If you wanted to, you could use corn flakes. You could use almond flour, cashew flour. So there's a lot of variations in this. It translates really nicely to literally any type of allergen-free food for your kid. What I've preheated is an oven at 375 degrees. They typically go in 20 minutes because the meat is already cooked. We're really just trying to give it a brown texture and also so it doesn't fall apart when you pick it up and put it in your hands. So let's see how we're doing over here in the old oven. Um, we've got a little brown coating. Not that chewy, not that crispy but a great texture. And if I break it apart, you can barely see that we've used almost a daily serving in vegetables with the yellow squash. This yellow squash, I'm telling you, is a blessing. Hopefully you're not allergic to it. And the reason why I like the yellow squash is literally when I cook it, I can't even tell it's in there. We also have the flaxseed meal. Flaxseed meal helps with the poop problems. And we have a recipe that literally almost every kid that doesn't like protein likes to eat these. Cooking is easy, you don't have to be afraid of it. But we want to hear from you. If you can let us know what recipes are important to you, maybe convert a recipe from a traditional flour or gluten base to a gluten-free or an allergy-free, we're here to help. So you get to us, you can email us at autismlive at gmail.com. You can reach out on Facebook at facebook.com slash autismlive, or reach out at Taka Now. And that way, you can see there are already thousands of recipes available with pictures. Uh, maybe we have some old favorites on there. So I know you're having a great day. I had a lot of fun cooking with you in the kitchen, but I'll tell you before we end, I got to have more meat puffs. Have a great day. How much do we love that? And how much do we love Lisa Ackerman? Absolutely brilliant. I know I promised you Dr. Thompson and we are connecting with him. We're figuring that out. Uh, I, don't, I don't know quite what the issue is, but we're figuring that out. Uh, wanted to talk a little bit about though, the whole idea of diet and dietary changes. Um, and so appreciate Lisa for taking the time. And we have more of these segments coming up in uh, January for you. Some really exciting things, including arguably the best macaroni and cheese that I have ever tasted in my life. And 
it's GFCF, so an SF, so you have to love that. Um, but so important that we uh, we talk about dietary things from time to time. Uh, while it is not ev every child on the autism spectrum's issue by any stretch of the imagination, uh, what we see are the, just like our children are individual, uh, and we're always trying to get people to look at them as individuals and not look at the label. Uh, really important for us to look at our children as individuals, and I I always talk about my son's little ecosystem that his intestines and his stomach they're they're their very own little ecosystem and it there's a very uh, tenuous balance of keeping him healthy and productive and really important that we look at keeping our kids healthy at the end of the day diet is so important and I know I really do know that for a lot of you out there that just sitting down to eat a meal can be a tough thing, uh, that there are so many other considerations and that sometimes in the realm of things you sit there and you think, okay, I'm not going to make an issue here. I need to make sure that my child is eating and that they're getting calories and I am spent. It's the end of the day and I can't have an argument about something else. And I agree that you should not be having arguments with your child about food and I agree that it's important to make sure that you get calories into your child, but if we could do that in a way that is really healthy and nutritious and that there isn't an argument and that your child enjoys eating it, isn't that what we're all looking for? And I think we can all agree that uh, these are the kinds of recipes that we need more of, <laughs> right? Uh, so you're sneaking those vegetables in, they don't even know, and, uh, and yet it's something that they're excited to eat. So thanks to Lisa Ackerman and all of the folks over at TACA who did such a wonderful job of putting that together. And again, we have more recipes that are coming to you. So we are, we're going to see if we can't hook up with Dr. Thompson because he's going to be Skyping in with us. And so we're figuring that out, but we're going to take a short break and we'll either come back with Dr. Thompson or we will do the question of the day while we get Dr. Thompson. So stick with us. Welcome back. Thanks for joining me today. For the month of December, we're going to be making wrapping paper. The skills we'll be focusing on today are pattern making, which is an academic skill. While you're doing this, you can also work on colors and shapes with your child. The materials you'll be needing are brown paper bag, paint, water, paintbrush, a tray or paper plate, paper towel, a sharp knife, which the adult will be the only one using, scissors, cookie cutters, and potatoes. And of course, you can always use pre-made stamps or sponges to use. All right, let's get to it. The first thing you wanna do is you're gonna take your potato and you're gonna cut it in half. So now I've got two stamps I could possibly use. So I'm gonna make a star and you can always do this freehand. I like the cookie cutters because it makes it a little bit easier. I'm gonna take the cookie cutter, I'm gonna squish that in there. Then I'm going to take my knife, I'm going to cut along the edge, and then I'm going to pop it out. And voila! Now that I've done this, I'm going to peel out the potato. And pull this out, and ta-da! There's my star. I'll be taking my recyclable paper bag and cutting it open. I'm just cutting along the edge. Now that I have this done, I'm going to remove the handles, like so. And then here you are. All right, now that I have this ready, it's a great time to have the kids join in. So I'm grabbing my reusable plate. And while you're squeezing out the paints to use, this is a great time to have your kids label the different colors and to discuss how to mix the colors together to make secondary colors. Now that I have my paint and my stamps ready, well, now it's time to start making the fun patterns. So I've got my piece of paper in front of me. I'm gonna take my star stamp and I'm gonna just dip it in the green paint I just mixed. See that there? And now I'm gonna place it onto my paper. Depending on the skill of your child, when you grab your stamps, you can ask them to label the shapes. 
you can start making the pattern and I can ask my child questions like, you know, what comes next? Or have them come up with the pattern themselves just straight from their head. Here are a few examples of wrapping paper that I completed today. When you complete your wrapping paper, again, I hope you take a photo of it and share it with us on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash autism live. I look forward to seeing them and seeing you next month. Bye. Can you see me? Can you see me flying by your side? Welcome back. We're, we're still uh, <laughs> figuring out the Dr. Thompson thing. But in the meantime, I want to go over some of your answers to the question of the day. We asked you today, uh, what gives you hope? And uh, you guys wrote in some really beautiful things. Somebody said, my kids, what a lovely thing. Another person said, my children. Uh, here's one that says, adult stem cells. Well, now there's a reason to, ha to have hope, right? Uh, someone else, just seeing him grow every day. Uh, another person, my son, my kids, God and my son. Knowing my daughter was giving a fair given a fair chance in school and wasn't uh, through in a, in a classroom, wasn't thrown, excuse me, in a classroom just for being labeled autistic. Some aut autistic children aren't as bad as others and deserve to be in a regular class like the rest of the kids. I, uh, I fault for this uh, for my daughter. Now she isn't in the class with kids that can't. Uh, can't even use a bathroom, I see. Um, so placement is really important. Another person who says, my children. Uh, someone else says, my two kids with three exclamation points, but seeing how they both overcome obstacles on a daily basis and seeing how they improve, that gives me hope. Um, uh, another person who says, I believe parents need to recognize the signs. There are signs and start getting their kids early intervention and stop being embarrassed by it and get these kids help. I noticed my daughter was different when she learned to sit up and I forced uh, Kennedy Krieger to get involved and because, she, because of that, she has had help since the age of one. You can't even tell she has autism. She goes to regular fourth grade class and is a straight A student. She can draw and sing like you wouldn't believe. So I believe parents need to stop being well and the and the phrase that they use was lazy and get their child the appropriate help i don't think that it's i will disagree with you on the lazy thing because i don't think uh i don't think that lazy comes into it i think fear and denial and fear and denial and fear um and i know that i spent a period of time in both of those things, fear and denial. And I will be honest with you that part of my fear was that both that there wasn't going to be anything to help him or that there would be something to help him and that we wouldn't be able to afford it. And for a lot of people, that has been the reality for a lot of years. We're changing that. We're trying really hard to change it for everyone. Um, but I don't, uh, I just, I, you know, I, I wish I had back that time when I was in fear and denial. And so I talked to you guys about how important it is to get that early intervention, but I don't think it's lazy. I don't think it's lazy for anybody. Uh, and that's just my take on it. Another person says, my kids give me hope. My son's specialist school for ASD kids and his teachers give me hope that one day I will have a conversation with him about his visual cards without his visual cards and iPad. That day is going to the, be the biggest win of my life. And I have great hope for you that that day will come soon. Another person says, my son. Uh, someone else says, my 11 year old brother who has autism, he's my life and he gives me hope. Lovely. My children. Each milestone my autistic daughter reaches gives me hope. She is amazing. My kids. The promise is found in the Bible for a better future. Another person says, my son has autism and somewhat mentally retarded, also ODD. I'm not sure that I know what that is. Uh, I get him uh, all the help possible and give him all the love I can. Another person who says, God and my daughter. Someone else who says, my three little boys. Uh, what a lovely image. Uh, someone says, my daughter's strength, she, has, uh, she hasn't given up and neither will I. Uh, again, somebody who says, my children and my family. I love those. I want to go to one of the other sites here. Um, 
it's important to have hope. It's important for us to be mindful of that and that in tough times to access what does give us hope. I know that, uh, I'm just scrolling down here to see. Uh, oh, and they're on our site. I can see them, the infamous meat puffs. There are the directions and the recipe. Gotta love that. Um, and I'm not seeing because I'm so bad at this. They changed Facebook and now I can't find anything. Uh, I don't know where it is. It's on the right. I don't see it. It's not on the right on mine. Well, it's not on mine because sometimes mine is slower than others. Uh, but I also wanted to say to you guys, I'll find it before we're done here. Uh, I wanted to say to you that earlier this the earlier this year, we talked about my son's IEP and that he, I had asked, I took some of the, the benchmarks and IEP goals from skills because I had done his, uh, yeah, already last year, I did his assessment, time well spent because then I could just go in and pick uh, from the list of things that I thought would be appropriate. I came up with three goals for him to work on during lunchtime and recess. One was a social goal, one was a language goal, and uh, I think one was a flexibility goal, uh, which would be under executive functions. So, and I presented them at his IEP, and I didn't know how that was going to go over and Actually, it went over so well that the school said, you know, since you've brought this up, has he been, eva been evaluated by a recreational therapist? A what? A who? A recreational therapist. Didn't know there was such a fish, uh, but apparently there is. Who knew? Um, I did not know. And so they asked my permission for him to be assessed by a recreational therapist. Of course, I said yes to this. And this wonderful woman came to his school, uh, observed him on two different occasions, and did her little report. And we had his follow-up IEP meeting last Friday. And, you know, a lot had happened on Friday and a lot had happened in my family early in the week. And so, you know, an IEP on top of everything. But it was an amazing, amazing IEP because this woman came in and said, I've assessed him and he does qualify for some help and consultation with a recreational therapist. And it wasn't a lot of time that he qualified for. I believe it was two hours a month. But uh, there were three goals that were slightly different than the ones that I I wrote in, but very good goals that she had and that she is going to train the staff on how to work with my son both in the classroom and on the playground to achieve those goals. And it was very exciting. Can I just say how very exciting it was? And can I tell you how much hope that it gave me? Um, it really did because I saw, okay, here is our plan for taking care of this. And there was a discussion about the fact that he is able to do it in small settings, but that it hadn't generalized to the playground and how we're going to make that happen. And, you know, I always talk to you guys about, well, if people aren't talking about generalization on day one, you're in trouble, right? Um, but there was a discussion about, okay, we're here, but it hasn't generalized. Here's how we're going to get to generalization. And it made me very happy. Now, I did say to this recreational therapist, didn't know that there was such a thing. And she said, well, not all schools are with it enough to know that this is important. But I think that one of the first things that we all need to do is ask. It does not hurt to ask, right? So I encourage you, uh, if you have an IEP coming up, and if you, I know many of you have written in and talked about those social goals and those social times of the day, um, that ask, is there a recreational therapist? Can my child be evaluated? And keep in mind that you may ask, it's important to ask both those questions, because if you just ask, is there a recreational therapist, the school may say no. But if you ask, can I have my child evaluated by a recreational therapist, it may be that they contract with somebody, but get it in writing. Get it in writing that you asked, right? You can send an email and get it in writing back from them that they're saying no. So if, they, if you write the email and somebody from the school the next time you're picking your child up says, oh, by the way, we don't have one, uh, then say to them, oh, you know, I'll need to get that in writing back from you that you're refusing to do an evaluation. Yeah, I know, it's stirring the pot. But sometimes we have to. 
that's just, you know, uh, all part of asking for the help that we need. And I will keep you guys posted on this because I'm very excited. And can I just say too, that my son's teacher was excited and how lovely it is when you have, you know, my, my whole, I'm an ex teacher. I love teachers, right? Uh, but there are some teachers who get it and some who don't. Shall we say that? Is that a nice way of saying it? And my litmus test always is when you ask a teacher about an opportunity for them to learn more, do they get excited or go, oh, because if they get excited, that's a good teacher. If they're excited about learning something and are not defensive and like, well, I already know that. Um, if they're saying, ooh, I'd like that new skill, that's a good teacher. That's somebody who's passionate about learning. That's somebody who should be with your child. If you get that teacher who's like, oh, well, I already know about that. That to me is red flag city. Um, in any case, we uh, are just about out of time here. And I don't know what our issue was, why we weren't able to connect with Dr. Travis Thompson, but we will. Um, and it may be that we have to connect with him tomorrow because we have guests that are going to be with us in just a few minutes. Um, but uh, we, we will, we will find out um, because we really want to talk to Dr. Travis Thompson. I also want to let you know that the main reason why he's coming on the show to talk to us is because he is heading up a conference that's happening in Portland, Oregon in January. I think it's the 25th through the 27th. And this is another ABAI event, Association of Behavior Analysis International. But this one specifically, you know, they do events regionally and internationally um, for ABA at large, right? Um, because we know ABA is a huge field. You can, there are people who use it for autism, but there are people who use it in business settings and there are people who use it with athletes and there are people who use it with politicians. I mean, you know, it's endless what it can be used for. Um, but this particular conference is just about autism. It is the, the yearly international conference for autism and there is a specific track that is just for parents. And we're very, very excited about that and want you to know about that. And and, um, registration for this event, um, early registration goes until Wednesday. So we're going to keep telling you about it. And I mentioned on Friday that one of the speakers at the event is the lovely Dr. Jonathan Tarbox. He was here with us on Friday talking about that, but the host of, oh my goodness, the speakers that they have lined up are absolutely amazing. Uh, comes to mind Catherine, uh, Piazza, who is fabulous about food and eating issues. And so I want to encourage you, if you have the capability to get to this conference in Portland, I think you will be so grateful that you did. Uh, really amazing opportunity uh, and want to encourage you to go to their website. Uh, and uh, you can Google uh, ABAI or ABA International uh, to sign up to go to this event, 25th through the 27th in Portland, Oregon. Uh, all right, we are, it's that time when we're going to watch the A Word. This is a new episode today. We've gone back to the beginning, but we're, we're working our way towards the middle of these episodes. We're following a little boy, Jack Riley, in an ongoing documentary that's being made here at the Center for Autism and Related Disabilities disorders to show what is possible with ABA. We know that the possibilities are infinite, right? That's why we have our infinity ribbons. Um, but I think it's so beneficial to have the opportunity to see that arc of ABA, how you take a small child and you begin working on these very specific things and you see that the child learns how to learn in this very specific way. And then it's, you know, it's endless, endless possibilities. And Jack Riley is learning a lot. It doesn't mean that it's all easy, right? I don't want to give anybody the impression that, oh, you start ABA and it's one long weekend and then by golly, you've got it. That's potty training, <laughs> right? That's the trajectory for potty training. One long weekend and you've got it, right? But imagine that's just one skill. And how many skills do you want your child to learn? How many skills is your child behind in their development? So ABA takes a while and there's quite an art because you're taking little skills and putting them together with other skills until your child is capable. Uh, so that's what Jack Riley's going through. Take a look. This is the A word. Hi, Jack Riley. 
Are you in the pool? Say hi, Suzanne. Hi, Suzanne. <laughs> he said that twice. We're just getting the camera. Hi, Suzanne. How's everything? Everything is good. We just actually increased our hours. So that's a little overwhelming. It includes pretty much therapy from 8, 8.30 till about uh, 6, 6, 6 p.m. 6 o'clock minus his nap time. Um, so that's, that's <coughs> challenging, but he's doing great. Six months ago, he had zero words. Now, I don't, I don't think I can count that high. He's got so many words. And the 25 hours, so is that strictly ABA or is that ABA plus? That's therapy? ABA plus two hours of speech therapy per week plus two hours of OT per week. So it's almost 30 hours, 29 hours. He, he works almost more than we do. So say that's like as long as my work week. Yeah, he's, got a, he's got a full-time job for a, for a two-year-old. A little two-year-old with a full-time job. Oh, a mouth. Where does the mouth go? Oh, nice job. So he has hands, eyes, nose, and a mouth. What else does he need? Does he need ears? Oh, there's one ear. What else does he need? Shoes. Where are his shoes? You're gonna put feet? Okay. What else does he need? A hat. Oh, a hat. Which hat is he gonna put on? That one. Say hi, Suzanne. Hi, Susan. Hi, Susan. <laughs> hi Jack Riley. Stop. Yay. We were diagnosed November of last year, so it's been seven months since we we've known that he has autism. He started speech therapy a month later, uh, occupational therapy, uh, probably within a few weeks of that, and then ABA we've done for three week, three months, months, April, May, and June. Right. And really, I think ABA. I I don't want to compare it to the others, but I mean we've seen huge, a huge impact on him. And it's just, also it's twenty some odd hours, right, uh, right. compared to two and four or whatever, but. But yeah, he's changed dramatically since ABA started. And it was hard in the beginning. We just even the, the biggest example I always come up with is they made him say his colors before he could use a marker to color, which was his thing at the time. Do you want green or orange? Ah. Which one's orange? Green or orange? Ah. Orange, yeah, good job. So what's like the differences between before you started therapy and to what the kind of kid he is now. You know, I actually have not full days, but very large portions of partial days where I forget about autism and just think I have a two-year-old. Um, specifically, he plays with it, plays with us. He engages us. He uh, he uh, he's funny. He makes he sort of makes jokes. I don't know how to explain that, but he does. Oh, you got it. The communication skills have increased dramatically where yeah, you know we were impressed with how he could label everything under the sun and mim yeah, mimic and now he's he's actually asking for things he's asking he's making requests uh, um, he wants help and sometimes he'll say specifically help open that would have been unheard of a few months ago open hope I don't remember this fascination with learning quite so much as the right. last few months. Right. And everything that he knows, he's always looking at us like, did, did you catch that? That I knew that? Did, did yeah. you see that? That I, are I knew you, that was coming? Are you hip to this? <laughs> <laughs> well, now it's gone. He's got it. Look at you being, mister. Can I see anything out there? I know. Now it's there. You see it? <laughs> Hilarious. The boy. Oh. Really? <laughs> yeah, how does how do you differentiate or like try to figure out like what is the autism, what is his personality, mm -hmm. what is we, we don't we don't understand at all really and and I think really we won't understand fully unless we have a neurotypical child second and 
I think as we go through stages, it'll, you know, bells will be ringing left and right. We'll be like, oh, that's what it was. Yeah, actually, I still have trouble explaining it to friends or family when they ask, well, how do you know? I still have trouble explaining it. I I know that we're right and that he's not misdiagnosed, but I still have trouble explaining it. We look at each other all the time and say, is that two or is that autism? And I don't (laughs) know that we ever answer it. Probably our most common question to each other is that, is that autism or is that two-year-old? I don't know. And I have both is probably what we usually say. Yeah. It's a little of both. Yeah. Puppy. What? Baby. Puppy. Baby. Puppy. Mommy or baby? I don't know. Puppy. Mommy. Baby. Mommy. Baby. 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 Is he a baby too? I'm not baby. 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 How does that affect everything now that you're pregnant and waiting for a sister? Were you nervous when you first found out you guys were pregnant? Well, yeah, we, we thought about it. I, I thought I would be more nervous about it all. But as I told a woman within probably less than a week of getting Jack's diagnosis, because we were already thinking about having another baby at that time, and asked her very honestly, are we crazy? Is, is this just a bad time to bring in another? Is this not fair to our son? Do we need to focus on him? And she led me through a few questions, and the ultimate thing I said was, I'll take five more just like him. And I would, in a heartbeat. He's great. He's Maybe not five. <laughs> I'll take five more just like him okay. if you're happy with just two. I'm happy with two. No, he's, he's, he's a happy kid. hasn't made him any less of a treat to watch him grow up and to watch him learn. He still is doing all those things. He might be doing them on a different timetable, but, but, but we haven't but, missed but out. But we don't anything. know the timetable anyway, yeah. so so we're good. We're golden. Ignorance is bliss. Yeah, he's, you know? he's great. He's great, and now and now we feel like we're on the right track. So, so uh, um, I, you know, I don't care what his timetable is. He's... He's learning daily. But I think that's the impression, you know, as a parent for sure. Before you experience autism, you think of it as sort of, you know, that everything's different. Yeah. And and it is, but in a way it's not at all, you know. There's still still kids and they're still fun. I could still see him being like king of the prom. Sure. He's a looker, good looking guy. He's charmed all his therapists. Uh, and and his his cinematographer <laughs> and uh, and, his, I, I, and his mom and dad. We're going to the pool. We're going to the pool. We're gonna put our swimming suits on and we're going swimming. We're going to the pool. Yay! We're going to the pool. Are we there yet? Are, Are we, we there, there yet? yet? My excitement's getting stronger. <laughs> We're going to the pool. We're going to the pool. Yay! Welcome back to Autism Live. I'm Shannon Penrod, and I'm so grateful that I'm sitting here with two fabulous gentlemen. We're thrilled to have them here in the studio with us, Alex Plank and Noah Trevino. And um, they are here today to talk about a documentary that they have made about the state of autism in France. Uh, and very aptly named Shameful. So let's talk, gentlemen, first about why. Why Why did you, how did you hear about the state of autism in France and why did you decide to make this film? Well, first I just want to thank you for having us. Uh, oh, thank you. It's been uh, a while since you've talked about having us on the show and we're finally actually sitting here. <laughs> Which is thrilling that it finally came to pass, yeah. yes. And I'm especially glad to have you guys here today and we'll talk about all that uh, a little bit later. But uh, tell us about what how this movie came about? Uh, basically, we had heard about the issue of autism uh, because of a article in the news. Uh, we were actually mentioned uh, by Steve Silberman, uh, I'm sorry, Steve Edelson. Mm-hmm. Steve Silberman's a friend of mine who's a writer. Okay. Um, two Steves. Actually, I accidentally <laughs> texted Steve Edelson when I was trying to text Steve Silberman last night, but that has nothing to do with it. <laughs> okay. So Steve Edelson, director of the Autism Research Institute, uh, actually mentioned it to us. I think he brought it up to you at a dinner yeah. at one point. Yeah, I had mentioned to him that we wanted to do more international mm-hmm. uh, issues, and he said, oh, well, do you know about France? And you know, I'm still kind of new to this community, and mm-hmm. um, I said, no, I had no idea what what's going on there, and 
he told me, well, um, let me let me break it down for you. And, and I have to be shocking. honest, yeah. you know, I, I, I'm not new to this community. We've been, uh, I, I think my son was diagnosed seven years ago, and I had not heard anything about in France, uh, what was going on in France. So what kinds of things was he telling you about that were going on? Basically, children with autism are being tortured. Mm. Uh, there's this technique that they call le pack, uh, and that is translated to mean packing. Mm. What they do is they wrap the naked uh, autistic child in frozen wet sheets that were, you know, in a freezer, and they put them there uh, in these sheets that they wrap them like a mummy. You know, everything but their mouth uh, generally, so they can breathe is covered uh, tightly, and it's a very traumatic thing. And and they do this for 45 minutes, and, and, and you know the kids can get hypothermia, and, and I, I believe. I heard it, that someone died from it. I, I, that's not verified. I, I don't know exactly, but but what we found when we went to France is uh, parents sending their children off to other countries to get services. Thousands of of French uh, families, and just this overall level of despair that's just incredibly tragic. And yeah. we actually got in touch with this woman named Sophie Robert and she made a documentary where she interviewed psychoanalysts. And the reason that this is actually going on is because psychoanalysis is very prevalent in France. So as you know, in America, uh, it was sort of went out of favor, you know, after the 40s and 50s. Yeah. And it hasn't really been seen as anything serious. People kind of see it as a joke now. But in France, it's it's completely mainstream everyone does it uh, and the psychoanalysts themselves are actually very powerful they they are treating all these kids and they don't believe that autism is actually a developmental disability they think it's a psychosis uh, and some of them don't even think it's real and so uh, okay and that's disturbing to me uh, right there but uh, how do they get from saying, all right, we, th obviously they take themselves seriously and think that what they're doing is productive. Uh, how, how can they be getting away with this? Is there anything scientific that they're pointing to of how this might be beneficial to no. a child? No, not at all. In fact, <clears throat> what they believe is that it doesn't matter whether or not uh, the psychoanalysis works or what they are doing works. It, what matters is what they believe and, and their, their view of reality is what doesn't exist. And they have all this sort of weird psycho babble stuff that doesn't have any logic or follow any sort of scientific basis. It's uh, a lot of people that we talk to uh, described it as a cult, and, and I would tend to agree with that. And the parents then are buying into this because they're not forcing the child to do this, but the parent is agreeing to let the child do this. The parent doesn't usually know. Um, in fact, uh, they only found out that uh, packing existed because a child from one of the nonprofits that exists in France uh, it was it was undergoing the treatment without the parents consent and everyone that we talked to whose child went underwent packing did not know uh, one of the families interviewed in the film actually found out that they about packing because their son was going to a school and this uh, news segment on a French television channel actually covered packing and oddly enough they sort of made it seem like it's this you know really nice treatment where they're helping these kids and obviously the parents when they saw it they were freaked out yeah and they, and they asked the, their child if, if he had so, so families are sending their children to a school, and uh, is this a, a special school that, that they're well, going to, or a typical public school kind of situation? Uh, well, I mean, technically, by law, they're s supposed to be allowed to be in public schools. However, it's by the discretion of the teacher, and for the most part, the teachers don't let them be integrated in normal classrooms. So they're either forced to go to day hospitals, which are psych psychiatric wards for children. Not really a place and, that you want a kid, a kid with autism to be. No, yeah. no services, no. Yeah, they, they just basically put them in a room and, you know, they spend hours there and then they come home. Or another option for them is to go to Belgium where they get some form of treatment. Mm -hmm. But overall, um, they're just left by the wayside. They don't... Wow. And so at some a, of these schools, that's when they're doing the packing and the parents aren't necessarily... The packing is being yeah. under... Uh, yes, yeah, so the, 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 the packing happens at the, host, the day hospitals. And 80% and, and of... Uh, there was a survey conducted by Autism of France, mm -hmm. uh, and they found that 80% of children with autism were not going to school at all, and that the ones who did were going maybe an hour 
a couple hours a week, if, if that. Okay. So is the parent thinking the child's going to school, and once they get to school, the school sends them to the day hospital, or does the no. parent know that they're going to the day hospital? They know they're going there, but okay. uh, they're kind of assuming that there's some... Educational of, aspect? Yeah, something productive going on, and, wow. and usually there's, for the most part, there's nothing productive about what's going on in these hospitals. Wow. Um, it's interesting because we had... Um, Scott Badish from the Autism Society uh, on the show and he was talking about the fact that autism needs to be viewed as a civil rights issue and that you know that for all of the organizations here in the United States we need to get our heads wrapped around that but clearly this sounds like a very clear civil rights issue in in France that that you know the right to for a child to be someplace and be productive uh, does not sound like it's there well right? there's no question it's a, it's a civil rights issue just for the fact that that children with autism are being tortured. Yeah. I mean, the Council of Europe actually condemned France uh, for for the packing, and and it's been in the news a lot. And there's actually a debate in France about the issue. And oddly enough, the the more humanist, uh, you know, the the I guess the left uh, in France is is all for packing because they they see you know therapies that actually work, you know, therapies, uh, you know, early intervention, any sort of thing like that is dehumanizing and you know, they call it dog training and so and they're against ABA because but they're for this packing yeah, yeah it's ridiculous wow that's some lack of education and I mean it's it, I mean the packings one thing that goes on I mean but the the front door to this issue is when they go to a doctor that's supposed to be helping them in some way um, they just basically blame the mother and they start asking weird sexual questions about how the child was conceived and what was the, your first contact with the child and that's the wow. reason why they are the way they are. It's and like the dark ages of autism. Yeah. Everyone we've talked to has, has used the term medieval dark ages. Yeah. Uh, it's, it's horrible right. what's going on. Yeah. We actually, uh, I started a nonprofit talking about the rights issue called Autism Rights Watch uh, okay. with uh, this guy named David Hertemont, who's uh -huh. a, an activist in France. And we're working on trying to do various things in f not only France, but places in the U.S. where, where kids are being denied access to school yeah. sometimes. I mean, because while it, it generally it, most kids get to go to school, there are schools that kick kids with autism out because of, and sometimes it's because the kid's getting bullied and, and it's causing a disruption. It's not the kid's fault, it's the other kid's fault, but they're right. kicking the kid with autism out. Cause, right. uh, and so we're, we're going around and, you know, to try to bring awareness about all these different issues around the world. Well, I'm really excited that you guys are here, and we're going to talk more about this. And because honestly, I, you know, you say this is in the news, I had not heard this, and I think of myself as being somebody who's fairly plugged in. So I'm glad that we're here and we're talking about this and letting more people know about it. I want to pause for a second and show the trailer to your film, um, so we can take a look at this really amazing documentary called Shameful. So let's take a look at the trailer. I have a, I had a son who, who had the Asperger's syndrome. When you have a, a son who is different, but you don't know why he's different, you just know that you have a son that's very different from everybody else, then you, you don't understand. Why is he acting differently? So you go to see a psychiatrist to ask for help. Instead of giving you help, they tell you that you're just a, a mother who is, is too possessive, or etc., etc., etc. And I realized what they were telling me wasn't adapted to my son, and I wasn't the mother they were saying that I was. And I became very angry because I had seen so many specialists and who just talked about anything. He had no help, and I had no help too. And if you don't have any help, things get worse. And my, my son eventually committed suicide. The situation in France is so bad that not many people can understand it is so bad.
Welcome back. Uh, so I just that wanted the to, yeah, yeah that was the trailer. I, I did want to say that it's, it does say fall, despite the fact that it's past fall and it hasn't come out yet. But, I mean, it, 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 doing a movie, uh, especially a feature-length documentary, yeah. uh, is an incredibly long process. Um, yeah. The editing in and of itself is... You know, can take years and years, and we fortunately were able to do it within less than a year. <laughs> yeah, it's been so uh, amazing, and I just have to say, you know, really beautiful. Uh, this juxtaposition of here are all these lovely romantic images of, of France, but done, you know, in black and white, so that it's, you know, this the, this idea that we all have of France, with the the voiceover of this mom talking about how atrocious this is, and her son eventually committed suicide, and then to see the tears. I mean, it's really uh, very emotional and very beautiful, uh, and it has the look of an art film. Is the entire thing that way? And I and I love this whole black and white, but the the flag and color is really lovely. Yeah, the uh, the film itself is is in color, but I mean, I would definitely say that it still is in the same style and, okay. and artistic. And. And so the film is not yet out. What uh, mm. and at what point? Because I know um, people are going to want to know how can I see this. One of the first things you're going to say is how can I see this? Where can I see this? And what can I do? You guys, we were just talking about this before uh, the show started about how when stuff stinks and it's just everything appears to be in the toilet. Uh, the thing that I've learned over the years is find what you can do. You can't fix everything. There's a whole lot of stuff you can't do, but find what you can do. And so now that I have this knowledge that this is what's going on in France, and I'm sure I'm not alone, I want to know what can I do. Um, and I would imagine that helping you to get this film seen by more people will is part of what you can do and what you're trying to do. Is that pretty accurate? Yeah. Um, I mean, as far as how they can see it, we don't have a definite answer for that yet. Okay. But it will definitely be available soon. Okay. Uh, for people to uh, uh, purchase and possibly, you know, depending on and, and how we're able to deliver it, also streaming online maybe okay. through Amazon or Netflix. And we will keep you guys posted iTunes. about that, about as uh, you'll let us know yeah. um, how people can see it because um, obviously you know people need to know about this uh, yeah it's it's amazing how many people I tell this to who are just completely shocked and you would yeah. think that more people would want to hear about this you'd think that this would be a bigger issue you'd think that there would be more in the news about it yeah. even though it's in France uh, right. this is a issue that affects everyone in the world absolutely often. and when there's one country doing that it, it doesn't matter you know what nationality you are you have you know the rights as a human and being not to be uh, tortured in that way, not to absolutely be denied access to any sort of education when everyone else is getting it, and I really hope that this this film will be seen by you know millions of people. Obviously, yeah. you know that's that's pretty far-reaching to, to think that that many people would see a film, you know that. I'm good with it. It's a good number for me, Alex. I think that's exactly what you need. It needs to be seen by millions of people um, because something has to change. Um, okay, let's let's backtrack a little bit and and talk about why uh, why this subject uh, is important to you even before you knew about what was happening in France. Why is autism a subject that's of uh, particular interest to you? Well, as you know, I, I founded WrongPlanet.net, yeah. uh, which is the largest online website for autism. And, uh, and the reason I started that is because when I was in, in school, I was bullied. I, I had a hard time uh, making friends. I, had, I was socially awkward, and I, I was diagnosed with, uh, as many, I'm sure most of your audience has heard of Asperger's syndrome, mm -hmm. which is now actually just autism. So, so I was diagnosed on the autism spectrum when I was around the age of nine, and and it was hard for me because I didn't know anyone else who had autism and I looked around in person specifically and I went on the internet to look for people and there were a few websites that had like five people each on them right and I and I actually one I did end up meeting one friend on online and he was also in the computers and we were talking about starting a website and mm -hmm. so so yeah the rest but, is history. But you weren't a computer programmer. You weren't. That wasn't what you wanted to do with your no, life. No, You had a, a computer programming. Originally, yes. I, I ah. was obsessed with computer programming. I, I've actually I worked at AOL doing systems programming. I've worked ah. in. Uh, I've worked as a developer for distribution of Linux. Uh, uh huh. And so I was always into computers. And okay. so, that, so back then, however, once I got into college, uh, I, I just I figured that. If, if I wanted to learn social skills, sitting at a cubicle writing code was not going to help me that much in terms of at, job, at a job. And mm -hmm. it just, the fact of the matter is learning 
computer science in, in college, a lot of the stuff I knew and the stuff I didn't know, I didn't feel like I needed to know because mm -hmm. it was a lot of theoretical stuff. So I decided to switch to film. I've always wanted mm -hmm. to do, make movies and. And uh, and clearly, you know, uh, I, I always think of computers, there is that element of creativity, but it's very defined with computers, it seems to me. I am right. not creative with computers. I'm creative with other things. But, yeah. um, but there aren't a lot of people who can make that crossover from that very defined computer thing to other things. And clearly, you are a deeply creative person. Right. Um, and so I'm thrilled that you have found both of these outlets. And it seems to me uh, it's brilliant the way the two go together because you founded Wrong Planet and it's helping so many people but you also make films and post them on Wrong Planet uh, that are of great benefit. Uh, you know, I was saying earlier that uh, one of the ones that we love here, you did uh, a piece on how to flirt. Yeah. And look, I, you know, I, I think it's really beneficial for anybody who is on the autism spectrum and who has questions about that. But the truth of the matter is, is there's all kinds of people who are not on the autism spectrum that don't know that information that you cover. Right. And it's amazing, though, a lot of the, the, the videos that, uh, you know, we, we film and, and Noah and I, you know, do this together. When I, when I go in there and I, I sit down and, you know, and Noah holds the camera and, and I ask the questions to the... To, 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 I, I, th I know the answers to most of these because I had to learn the hard way right. most of these social skills. But when I put it on the, 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 what, the website and when I put it on wrongplanet.net, what I found is people are so grateful that this information is out there. Yeah. And, I, and I always wonder, hey, is this just too rudimentary? Are people actually going to learn anything from it? And, and the answer is usually, no, it's not too rudimentary. <laughs> people are learning a lot. Yeah. And, you know, they say things like, oh, I wish this existed when I was your age. You know? Yeah. So... I think that's really helpful. We just put out a new one about yeah. how, to, how to join a social circle. It's, uh, it's up on Wrong Planet. Love so that. I guess okay. We can check that out. Uh, I think we'll take a little bit of a break and we'll come back and talk some more with these fabulous gentlemen and talk some more about this really important documentary. But I want to encourage people if you have questions about the documentary, what is the website? Uh, shamefuldocumentary.com. Okay. All right. So you can check it out there. And we'll be back after these messages. Hi, I'm Bryce Myler and I'm the Contracts Director for the Center for Autism and Related Disorders. I've been here for about five years. CARD has several employees with many years of insurance experience uh, dealing with insurance, dealing with pre-authorizations, dealing with discovering whether there's coverage or not. So we have more experience than any ABA provider that I've ever come across. So for, for a prospective client, somebody that may be interested in you know ABA therapy and what CARD has to offer, we have a special 800 number um, and you call that number. They will talk to you about what we have to offer, uh, how ABA works, they'll ask you for the front and back of your ID card and then we check to see if you do or do not have coverage. If you have coverage for ABA therapy, we try to do whatever we can to set it up where we can bill for you and you don't have to fight with the insurance company every month to get your claims paid. For California residents, we recently did a series of insurance trainings all over the state and you can click on the link below to watch pretty much the full presentation. It has a lot of information how you can get your insurance company to, to comply with what they're supposed to do, uh, understanding the networks and many other um, valuable pieces of information. Welcome back. I want to thank you all for tuning in and watching for this very special segment of Autism Live. We're here right now with Alex Plank and Noah Trevino. They are the filmmakers for the documentary Shameful. Uh, somebody has written in and said that uh, is there an ABA presence in France? Are, are there people who are doing ABA in France? They're few and far between. Few and far between. There's like There's three. One. <laughs> yeah, well, there. <laughs> There's one university program that even trains people with ABA. If you go to the ABA website, then you can count count the number of ABA therapists there on your on your hands. And wow, uh, normally, really frightening. Normally, they bring people over. Um, we met someone who has to bring someone over from England. Wow. 
Uh, and, you know, and, and it's really important for us, uh, today our whole topic was about hope, you know, and, and I think it's important to remember what to be grateful for. Things are not how we want them to be with autism here in the United States. Um, and there are a lot of people who are watching who are hoping for an ABA provider to come to their community. Um, but it's also important for us to realize how much further we are in some respects. We were saying, you know, the, in France, it's the dark ages of autism. Somebody else wrote in and said, oh, OMG, I just Googled this and found a YouTube video of this happening. I want to throw up. I could never imagine doing this or allowing someone else to do this to my son. Uh, and I'm, I'm right there with you. It, it, I, like, it makes me shake. I, I can't believe. I, you know, one of the things that I've talked about a lot is that uh, how lucky I was that when my son was diagnosed, we lived in Los Angeles County and what was available to us and that it had kept me awake. It still keeps me awake sometimes thinking about the parents who you know, or in a small town in Kansas who don't have access to what I had access to and that that's not okay. And to think that, you know, my child in this day and age could have been born in France and could have had this happening without my knowledge. Um, it's a very frightening thing to me. And I think of those kids as being all of our kids. Um, and we, we talked a little bit uh, before about what kinds of things can we do. What would you recommend to parents who are watching this uh, who didn't know about it, to this person who says, I'm, I'm absolutely shocked, what, what can we do? Well, first of all, go to the website. Uh, shamefuldocumentary.com. There's links to all the social network sites. Okay. Click on those. S sign up to the you know Facebook group. Uh, sign up with a Facebook account. Uh -huh. Sign up to you know follow Twitter. Follow us on Twitter. It's Shameful Movie on our tw as our uh, Twitter handle. Sorry, uh -huh. I can't speak. Okay. Um, and uh, not only that, but you know, go to wrongplanet.net. Check out the resources there. Talk about it. Yeah. When it comes and out, share it. I would share guess. It, yes. Yeah, so that more people know, because if more people knew about this, they couldn't get away with it. And also, the Autism Rights Watch. Uh, go to autismrightswatch.com. Okay. Uh, we have various stories on there as well about f things going on in the, even in the U.S. and in France and, okay. and in other countries where people with autism rights are, are being violated. And it's a big issue. It's not just France. There are other countries that do other things that are bad. But Autism rights watch com. Yes. Okay. Absolutely wonderful. Now, I wanted to take a second. Uh, yeah, somebody wrote in uh, the line from the REM song, it's the end of the world as we know it, and I don't feel fine. Um, and I think we, we, you know, it has felt that way a little bit the last couple of days. Um, I want to talk a little bit, though, about how you two came to meet and how uh, your relationship as filmmakers has come to be. And uh, so where did you guys first meet? Well, we met in college. Mm -hmm. um, I believe it was in screenwriting. In screenwriting class we, we met. Okay. And uh, I had no idea who Alex was in you know, the autism community. He was just Alex to me. And he came, you know, came bumbling in and started talking <laughs> about Alex, you could never bumble. I don't bumble. I, he I, doesn't I, I, I float. There you go. <laughs> he came floating I in. I float. And uh, <laughs> was talking about how he was on Good Morning America and The View and things like this. And I, I just, you know, I didn't really believe what he was saying. I thought it, you know. He thought he was making it up. Yeah. And um, <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, he would always talk about Wrong Planet, but I had no idea. So you had already started Wrong Planet by that point when you were in college. I started it in high school. Wow. I, I was actually, it was, it's a funny story, I was at, at my grandparents' house uh, during a lot of the starting of it, and I was working with another guy in Vermont who was 15, and I was 16, just turned 17, um, and I, they didn't have a internet at their house, my grandparents, so I'd have to bike to the library to, like, work on this website. <laughs> Uh, well, uh, that's wonderful, and we talk all the time with parents about when when you have uh, a child or a young adult or a teenager, and when there's something that they're interested in, feed that interest. Yeah, and uh, yeah. you know, clearly, you were, you were going to do whatever it took. Exactly. I mean, the reason my parents, my grandparents didn't have the internet is they didn't know what it was. I mean, my parents <laughs> did. I mean, that's a, that's a different story. Uh, um, well, but, but the, our friendship. Yes. You know, I, I think it, it, what we have is pretty unique. Uh, but at the same time, a lot of people with autism have friends that are neurotypicals. Well, and let's clarify, because uh, Noah, you are not on the spectrum. No, I'm not. And so when you met Alex, you, how much did you know about the spectrum? I knew nothing about it. I mean, I say this all the time. Alex is just Alex to me. Right. And I, I don't really, I can't 
comprehend it otherwise. Right. So So you looked at him as him, uh, yeah. which is the basis of any good friendship. But so you guys have been really good friends since then, and you make well, films together. Well, I mean, to be honest, we didn't really know each other that well until we moved out here. Okay. I mean, we, we were, were acquaintances. Yeah, we were pretty good okay. acquaintances, and, you know, we'd... We'd see each other once in a yeah. while at parties and things like that, uh -huh. birthday parties. But, um, yeah, it wasn't until we moved here because I mentioned to Alex that I wanted to move to Los Angeles, mm -hmm. and he, you know, took to that idea almost immediately. And we just, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it was a year-long process because uh -huh. I had to save up money. But um, yeah, we moved out here and just pretty much immediately started working together. It was it was pretty. Yeah, it was pretty immediate because I always wanted to work on his show. Mm -hmm. Autism Talk TV. Yeah, Autism mm -hmm. Talk TV. And he just said, I have an episode and would you like to edit it? And it just kind of happened that way. Mm -hmm. And We've been working but, together but, ever since. And you would classify yourself as really good friends, though, at this point. Yeah, I mean, yeah. It, we're roommates now. And I, I got him to move into my, <laughs> into my apartment. I was like, you need to move in. <laughs> you get more work done. And uh, it is. And uh, so in terms of what about Noah do you notice that's different than how you uh, your modus operandi. What do you notice about him that you think is? Is there a time when you think, oh, well, that's because he's neurotypical, or you just think of him as Noah? Well, I, uh, first and foremost, I think of him as Noah. Right. Uh, but I would say that he, he definitely is is really good to have as a friend because you know if I say something that might be insensitive or you know that I didn't realize or he's very sensitive to that. He can pick up on things uh -huh. that, and you know he tells me things that that can help me out. I mean, I help him out on other you know issues too. I mean, we have a very positive relationship because we're constantly telling each other things that, you know, help us each improve, I think. Right. You, would you agree with that? I would, well, yeah, I'm, I have to admit I'm a very uh, sensitive and emotional guy sometimes, so... Um. That's great! <laughs> That's a wonderful thing. Nothing to apologize for. No, uh, no, I mean, I'm just being honest, but um, there's certain... Yeah, he's helped me a lot as far as talking to people and uh, so he's like helped that. you socially yeah because i can be yeah it's kind of strange that way it's it's awesome that way yeah <laughs> i love that well yeah it's it's not it's not typical at all but um yeah i mean i could be very introverted so he's helped me kind of change that which is interesting because when you think of autism you don't necessarily think extroverted i i just i try so hard to you know be out there and be social that i, I I actually think that I've had an influence in that way in making you more extroverted in a way. Yeah, I mean, we're also we're very similar, so sometimes we tend to overcompensate in some areas. And there you go. It's just the way it is. And Alex, when when you were diagnosed with uh, Asperger's at the age of you said nine, I, I just like to say autism, just because okay. it, you know the the differentiation between autism and Asperger's is is, is actually really not. It's not well, uh, well right now way, with it, it, we're under the DSM four yeah, and it's, it's still small on. then but then DSM five it's gone exactly um, but okay so uh, but I appreciate you telling me how you'd like me to language it I always appreciate that but so you were diagnosed as being on the autism spectrum then that that works for you or autism uh, autistic. So, okay, autistic. Uh, okay, at nine. Uh, you know, my son doesn't like the term autistic. He likes to say has autism. Yeah, I think it's, I think who, it's, personal, I think it's a right? personal thing. I, right. I don't like other people dictating to you what you should say or how you should describe yourself. I think. Yeah, absolutely. I agree with that. I don't really personally have, sometimes I will say with autism, I, I don't, a lot of people with autism or people who are autistic do have a very strong belief in the idea that you shouldn't use first person language or for person first language right and then there's another group of people on the autism spectrum you know people with autism who believe that person first language is really important so right exactly so it's, it's interesting yeah. isn't it and all the more reason why we need to look at individuals as individuals yeah. but um at, at the time that you were given a diagnosis, were there specific things that you were given to help you? Did you go to any like social skills classes? Did you do any ABA? What was available to you? No, I. The most that was available to me was uh, at high school. There was uh, the guidance counselor would help me out on a personal level, and at some some guidance counselors would try to give me books that tell you these things. And, and the thing is that when you read about it in a book. You don't get that 
real experience that that allows you to learn it mm -hmm. and even in a social group if you're only in the group and you're not going out and doing this to people who don't realize that you're practicing you're going to get varied responses and there is no answer of how people are going to respond to you socially right. you can say this will work and it will work for one person right. and it might not work for the next person it yeah. might actually make them mad at you you might say something so so people the whole social issue is so complex that it is that Social skills training is important, but you got to really just go out and learn on your own. And that's what I did. Yeah. I actually went out and I would just talk to as many people as possible and try to see what worked and what didn't and make as many friends as I could in college, especially. Well, uh, and amazingly, it has taken you to places that are helping other people, which is brilliant, and hopefully are going to help people in France with this documentary. I think we should take another break, and then I want to come back and get your thoughts, the two of you, on the reaction to what happened on Friday, and so many people uh, are throwing words around about uh, what the diagnosis of the shooter. Um, we're, uh, we're being very mindful on this show, in case you uh, haven't noticed, to not say uh, the name of the shooter. I think that that's really important. Um, but uh, that words have been thrown around, and there's a big reaction in the community and outside the community. And I know people called me over the weekend and said, "What are your thoughts on this?" And you know, is this something that you are afraid about uh, for your child? And is this something that I should know about? And so. Well, before we go to break, I just yeah. want to say that there there is no link between you know violence, especially planned violence like what happened and autism. In fact, uh, you know people with autism are more likely to be the victims of crimes like Absolutely. this than to be the perpetrators. But Absolutely. You know, break no, and I, and I appreciate right. you saying that because uh, you know, and I want to talk with you uh, more about that. And a lot of. Uh, there have been a lot of voices uh, saying that very loudly in social media over the weekend, but I don't think we can say it enough. So thank That's you for saying it again. All right, so we're going to take a break and we're going to come back and talk more with Noah and with Alex about uh, last Friday's events. Just stick with us. Mostly the behavior started at night, but it was invading the day where he would just speak one syllable and babble and pace around. When she was a year old, she lost speech. Um, she did never seem to request me for anything, even for food. He told me over the phone that I should just put her in an institution. I was devastated. I was. Webster Institution, a hospital. Yeah, isn't that nice? He told me that it was possible or likely that Ruffin would never be employed, that he would never work uh, productively, that he would not know that I loved him, nor would he love me, nor would he be likely to marry. There's a 50% chance that he won't be able to talk at all, but if he does talk, he will only be able to, you know, make simple um, desire requests, I want, things like that. And probably by the time he was 10, he'd be in a home. Doreen told me that he would recover, and Doreen told me that he would go to regular kindergarten. I really have a very normal kid now, and lots of normal worries, but not extraordinary ones. My name is Deli Popola, and I'm one of the creators of TheOtspot.com. TheOtspot.com is an online support system for families and specialists who are affected by autism across the whole world, share inspirational stories, find resources in their area. Um, hope you can join. Welcome back to Autism Live. Our very special guests right now, Alex Plank and Noah Trevino. They are the filmmakers uh, behind the documentary Shameful about the state of autism in France, and it is, in fact, shameful. Alex is also uh, the creator of wrongplanet.net, a wonderful networking site that I would encourage you if you have teenagers, young adults, or adults on the autism spectrum, that you check it 
out and have them check it out, wrongplanet.net. Alex is also going to be with us on Wednesday when we have Nancy Allspot Jackson for Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. Alex is going to join us again, and we're going to talk more about Wrong Planet then. I want to uh, bring up that somebody wrote in and said, kudos to Alex for overcoming his hurdles in doing this. If he had not just said that he was on the spectrum, I never would have known. Good for you. Um, and uh, we, we had a little discussion about that during the break, that that's sort of a double-edged thing for you, that on the one hand, uh, you appreciate what they're saying. Um, well, I appreciate the feeling behind what they're saying. I mean, mm -hmm. I definitely have had a lot of challenges, and I mm -hmm. still continue to face them. It's just that, that I've been able to learn the mm -hmm. skills that are required to interact in an interview setting, interact yeah. uh, with you, interact socially, and it's still hard. And I think that just the fact that you learn these skills doesn't change the fact that you're autistic or you have autism. Mm -hmm. it, 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 you're going to be autistic whether you like it or not. That, that's just who you are. I think. I think it's part of who you are. I think that there are definitely negative issues that a lot of people with autism face. But a lot of times people say, "Oh, I want to cure my kid's autism." And I mean that the, the autism is not like this disease that you you catch. It's mm -hmm. it's part of you know who you are. You can certainly, you know help your son or daughter get better at certain aspects and, right. and I was horrible when I was a kid I, was, I had so many troubles but I was able to overcome those right. and I wouldn't say that I overcame the autism itself because right. I still am identifying like with autism so. and I was just making the point with Alex that as a mom that um, to me, I look at my child and there are some gifts that came with autism. There are some things that are extraordinary about my son that I can't separate from the autism and never would. But there are some disabling aspects of the disorder and that as a parent, that's always the thing that I'm trying to help my son to overcome. And I look at you and I see no disabling aspects of the disorder. And that makes me so happy and hopeful that it, you know, it's like light in the room. Um, and I know that you give that to a lot of parents, Alex that it's that we see okay that you know here I see the gifts I don't see the disabling aspects and that's I think what all of us are striving for um, and it's a wonderful thing it's a great thing uh, and I appreciate that you are so open about it because I think that there are a lot of uh, not to take anything away from you because I think you you are unique and fabulous on your own but there are a lot of individuals who uh, had have this diagnosis and that they're at the top of their field and not disabled in any way and I know you see them it's on true. wrong planet it's all the time and, and I think more of us need to know about that as parents, how possible that is. It's very possible. In fact, I, I read stories every day. New members sign up to Wrong Planet and they, they post, oh, I'm new here, I'm you know, 54 years old. I've, mm -hmm. When I was a kid, I was bullied. I, had, I refused to do, go to school. I had all these troubles. And then, you know, now they're a lawyer, now they're a doctor, they're a writer for, you know, a TV show. They're <laughs> really anything. I, yeah. They're a model. They're, it really depends. Right. And not all of them are, are out there in the world saying, and I also have this diagnosis, uh, they're living their lives. Right. But I think it's especially wonderful that you are open and out there about it so that you, you do give us all hope. But keep it's in mind that the fact that these these individuals feel the need to sign up for the site does show that there are still aspects that they, that they have issues with. There are still aspects yeah. that they, they sometimes struggle with even though they're living a great life, everyone has issues that they struggle yes. with, you know? Uh, this is a specific set. So I think that it's important to realize that having autism is, is not a, a, a bad thing, really. I, I think that there are bad tra uh, bad things that you can have that... There are disabling aspects. Yeah, they're dis that's, let's uh, be honest they're about definitely, that, yeah. that's, uh, that's definitely true, and, and, it, and it is hard. A lot of people are incredibly depressed, and, and yeah. it's really sad for me when I read that because yeah. A lot of the times this depression comes from being rejected by society, you know, that they're constantly, you know, when you're a kid and you're bullied and you're thrown in lockers and, you know, your hair is pulled and you're kicked and, and beaten, like, and just kicked, and like, you know, people put your head in toilets. And I read stories like this on, mm -hmm. on the site. I mean, if that happens to you, I, I honestly, why, why wouldn't you be upset? Why wouldn't you be depressed? I yeah. mean, it's very hard. And I think that bullying in and of itself is something that definitely needs to be yes. addressed. It, Yes. As well as understanding. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, we have another question that came in. Somebody wants to know, what do your families think of your work? 
And that's for both of you. Noah, what fun. does your family think? Uh, I mean, my mom's proud of me. My, you know, my dad's proud of me. I mean, I, I never would imagine I would be doing this, you know. Right. And luckily, I know Alex, and he got me involved in doing something good for people. Yeah. And, um, I mean, it's not to say that I never wanted to do anything good for people. It's just that I, I didn't... I wasn't put in a position to, yeah. you know? So. But I love the fact, Noah, that you you were in the position and you said yes, you were open to it. That's a wonderful thing. Absolutely. Uh, I, I mean, I've done a lot of things over the past, you know, two years or so that um, I'm really glad and happy about. I'm glad that I can help these families in some way. I, I'm not going to say that the film is going to change what's going on over there necessarily but at least people will know about it right. and that's i think the most that we could you know possibly the first ask. step yeah. right is, is letting people know and alex what about you how proud are your parents i'd say they're very proud and and, and i'm really thankful for what they've done for me i, I mean they've, they were always very supportive they were always looking for the highest possible I mean, even when I was in high school and I was so depressed that I refused to go to school and I was failing a lot of my classes uh, and getting bad grades and, and the ones that I wasn't failing. And they they were worried that I wouldn't go to, to college, but they still pushed me to do it. And, right. and in fact, I, I ended up going. And a lot of parents of kids in high school, and I love talking at conferences to parents because they're in the situation where they have this kid in high school and they think he's not going to go to college because right. he's having these issues. But it's definitely a possibility for all of us for Isn't sure that wonderful and independence is as well love that uh, we've got another question here my question for your guest is how do you curb your interests my son needs me to constantly engage him in appropriate behaviors otherwise he repeats favorite t tv clip youtube clips music phrases everything has to be on a timer did your mom or dad constantly have to curb your activities it's so frustrating as a mom not knowing if my son will ever grow out of this need to obsess he's 10 and mainstreamed yeah um, well, I, I can that? say that uh, that I did the same thing as a kid. My mom would would be constantly annoyed that I would go to Blockbuster and rent the same video. Or and did she it. try to <laughs> curb it though? Did she put you on limits, or did she just let you run? No, with she it? just let me go. Okay. But I th I, th I think like John says that I like, say go. Like, I say let them go with what they're interested yeah. in. I was I, my parents. I'm sure were fed up about <laughs> hearing about the Linux operating system. <laughs> fed up about hearing about programming in Perl and C++ and Java. And I'm right back about, about hearing Minecraft. about architecture and of, <laughs> yeah. of you know various computer processors. I'm sure they were fed up with that, and I know they were. And you know, and I would obsess about other things that were more you know negative. Mm -hmm. Like uh, I would worry, and and they. It was hard for them because I would constantly say the same things over and over again, seek assurances that I, I, I would get really anxious and worried about things that, that happen and get obsessive about those and keep asking my parents about them. And yeah, you, 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 when you get the, the more you, you grow, the, the more you get more well rounded in a way. You know, the more you're able to, to yeah. realize that that's an interest and that you have time for that and then you have time for other things. I don't know how old the child is. 10. 10? Uh, yeah. yeah. I was 10. I was... Obsessed on... Were you obsessed uh, on one thing or one realm of things? Depended. I okay. would get... I would go through phases of being obsessed about different things. Okay. Because I wonder if that's sort of the key, because you, you know, you just described that there were like four or five things that you were obsessed with, but I wonder if, if that's the key, having four or five things. Well, yeah, but the thing is that I would mm -hmm. be obsessed with the one thing for like a few months and okay. then maybe I would move on to the next and then I would have gradually start getting obsessed with multiple things. Uh, okay. Definitely one specific YouTube video is is very common. I mean, I okay. hear, hear that all the time and I think that there's a way to not curb the interest but turn that into something productive. Ah, there you so, go. So you use that video to, to teach various different skills and you use the obsession with trains to, you know, teach. Mm -hmm. Even math, as Temple Green, I would say, mm -hmm. do math with trains, you know? Yeah, she, absolutely. I, I interviewed her, I've interviewed her a few times, and she's always pushed that notion of, of, of making sure that the special interest is being... Feeds into other things. It, yeah, and it's being treated in a way that it's actually a good thing. Yeah. Because it really is. That, that yeah. focus is what makes us have these positive aspects. Right. I mean, that's true throughout the spectrum. Uh, well, I think that's a universal issue is being obsessed with something. I'd, I'd say let, 
let the kid be obsessed yeah. with it. I mean, it's a fine line between obsession and passion, isn't it? I, well, I don't think there's you know. a di difference, really, <laughs> yeah. to be honest with you. Yeah. I think passion is just a, a word that people use when they want to be more positive about obsession, and there obsession is a word that's used when they want to give it a negative connotation <laughs> or a neutral connotation. There you go. Well, I feel, okay. like, I feel like you naturally move on. You know, you you Eventually, heard, yeah, yeah, and then and then it turns it like you said it turns into something good, okay. like watching movies constantly or constantly watching the yeah. same movie turns into making them or yeah, oh, very possibly yeah it gets yeah. okay. We said we were going to talk a little bit about the events of Friday, and um, of course there are people who have. Uh, are focusing on the fact, um, and I don't think we've had absolute proof, but uh, friends and family saying that according to the mom of the shooter that he had a diagnosis, um, and they're using the word Asperger. And a lot of people, um, you know, after the, the Colorado um, Aurora, movie theater yeah. uh, shooting, uh, Joe Scarborough had made a comment that he said, I think what we're going to find out is that this individual was on the spectrum. And people rose up and said, you know, not helpful, not helpful at all. And I think there's a mis. Uh, conception when people talk about having a social deficit and what I consider sociopathic behavior that they're starting to link these two things together and I think that's really dangerous yeah fortunately from everything I've seen it it's not so much that they're they're specifically saying that that that, that the autism is the cause for this and just the mere fact that they're discussing this at much, as much as they are I think it is a problem because it, it's giving people the impression that they could be linked. Right. I, I'm getting, I'm looking at analytics for, for Wrong Planet, and I'm getting hundreds and hundreds of requests for things uh, on Wrong Planet where people are, are wondering if people with autism are killers. You know, it's right. like terms like autism, you know, causes violence or autism, yeah. which is... It's completely good wrong. It's good that they're searching for it because that means that they're actually not taking it at face value. Right. And it's good that they're finding my site because it says that doesn't cause violence. So, right. But, for every one of those people, I'm sure there's thousands of people who just hear it and think think that maybe that's a cause. And there is no link between it. It's it's yeah. in the I don't know. I, I think what was it? How many days? It was three days ago that this yeah. happened. On, yeah. In the, in those three three days, you know how many how many people were murdered just because of the fact uh, it just ran, random violence. There's a lot yeah. of it. I mean, and not just random violence, but people kill people every day. Hundreds of people were killed since that happened. Yes. And, and I bet you most of the people involved had absolutely nothing to do with autism. It didn't yeah. have autism, and that's not mentioned. Right. It's, and I, and I, I think at an already disturbing event, I mean, I don't think there's anybody who's looking at this in any other it's way just so that it's sad. a complete and, tragedy. You know, when I heard about it, I just immediately went on, on Twitter and just, you know, mentioned that my heart, you know, heart thoughts and prayers were went out to the families and the victims of, of the, such a horrible tragedy. Yes, absolutely. But to... But, you know, to compound that tragedy with a further misconception about a disorder that is already greatly misunderstood. One thing that really bugs me is the fact that they they keep saying, uh, the pundits on cable news channels keep saying mental uh, health issues or, mm -hmm. or you know, uh, mentally ill. Uh, which is mental illness is not autism is a completely separate thing. Yeah, and completely. it's making it seem as if it's part of that. And, right. and they're talking about trying to address this and, and I, I worry about the fact that anyone who's sort of awkward and, and shy and a loner is going to end up being, <laughs> uh, there's going to be a Concerned witch hunt. And, yeah, and, and, people... and, and perhaps further bullied or ostracized as a result. Yeah, for instance, one comment I, I read last night that really made me sad and, you know, and I've been reading a lot of comments on Wrong Planet is that uh, someone said, Oh great! How am I going to enjoy Christmas? You know, after people are talking about autism in this this event, uh, you know, what what are my family going to think of me? I'm going to. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I'm, I'm absolutely. I'm afraid to be. I'm afraid to spend time with my relatives. I don't know what they're going to say. Right. I mean, I will be honest with you. The part of my concern about sending my child to school today, he's very open about the fact that he has a diagnosis, and part of my concern was, what are some of the other kids going to say to him? You know, that he has nothing to do with this event, other than he's a person on the planet, at who uh, who felt some of the sadness and dismay at what happened, and the fact that another child may, in some way, decide that he's linked to it was disturbing to me and, and you know a lot of these and I, I keep hearing about different past events that you know people went off and killed 
a lot of people and 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 one common theme is like oh well it's a, a white male and he's he's socially awkward and a loner it's like well first of all that's a lot of people and it really most, is and like 99.9999999999 percent of those people don't kill anyone right and i think that it's really sad that it's causing issues for people in school. Like when, when I was in uh, upper elementary school and middle school, kind of uh, the, the whole Columbine thing, you know, they were talking about bullying and stuff yeah. be, being the cause. And, and a teacher said something like someone was bullying me and a teacher's like, you should be nice to him. Look, look, look at what could mm -hmm. happen. It's like, no, could, how nice could a teacher, yeah, yeah, how could a teacher say something like that? Right. When I told my parents, they were shocked and like yeah. disturbed and upset. Yeah, but someone, you should be nice to people because it's. Or they the should right be. Thing they said it specifically pointed me out. They're like, you should be wow. nice to Alex. You know, look what happens when people get bullied. It's wow. like, really, you're gonna say that? Wow. It, it's this. I mean, to be fair, bullying does cause people to be depressed and really upset. It doesn't cause people to become killers. That's right. That's right. Important things, and I, we're out of time, but I, I want to thank you guys so much. Somebody wrote it in and said, great guests, so articulate, bright, and kind-hearted, beautiful interview. I want to thank you guys for being here. And Alex is going to be back with us on Wednesday. Noah won't be able to be with us on Wednesday. He's off, off for man. the holidays. But, uh, but Alex will be with us during Let's Talk Autism with Shannon and Nancy. I know Nancy's thrilled that you're going to be here, and I'm thrilled that you're going to be here as well. I want to remind all of you that there are lots of ways that you can get in touch with us, and if Emily has time, she'll show you some of those different ways on the screen but I also want to remind you that uh, two things uh, that I, I go to wrongplanet.net um, and check this site out because you've seen these incredible young men and uh, I think you'll be thrilled when you go to that site all the information that's available to you there and also shameful documentary and also that was my second thing shameful documentary.com make sure that you like it on Facebook and what's the advocate uh, the it's autism rights watch and you can get that autism, autism rights watch rightswatch.com. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow at 10 a.m. Uh, Pacific Time, 1 p.m. Eastern Time. So uh, make sure that you're with us. Until then, please give your kiddos a hug from me. Bye-bye for now.